interesting and also in afterwards uh, uh, for further studies reveal that it is not actually this, the acidians that produce the metabolites, but are bacteria that are species specific of the acidians that produce this compound. Furthermore, among acidians, there are very peculiar species. For example, these species that belongs to the genus Ocnagnemide are macrophagus, not filter feeding such as all the other acidians. What does it mean? They have uh, developed this really peculiar oral siphon developed in two real lips, uh, like a mouth that craft the, the, the food. So they are able to catch zooplankton. And we were able to spot uh, one species that belongs to this family in uh, Eolonian archipelago on, in the 500 death. And this was the first record in Italian waters and the second in situ observation through ROV. Acidian is also used as model organism uh, in several fields like uh, genetics, developmental biology, and especially these two species, Sion and Tessinalis and Bosrio Chosseri. But uh, recent uh, molecular studies revealed that these two species are not just two species, but they are a complex of cryptic species that are uh, several from a molecular point of view. And it's really difficult to uh, distinguish from a morphological point of view. So we have four species for cyanintestinalis and at least five for Botrylus chosseri. That's why integrated taxonomy is really important in the study of this organism. And it has to join morphological analysis with detailed morphological description, uh, dissection of the organism, and uh, tables of the inner characters and key to species uh, with the support of molecular analysis. Uh, for example, with the, um, with the analysis and uh, the use as barcode fragment of the mitochondrial CO1. A really interesting thing is that uh, among this Sayona, uh, Sayona genus that is really wide, uh, widespread and also used as model organism, we were able to describe a new species in the Mediterranean Sea that is also one of the most studied species, uh, studies the sea in the world. So Sayona intestinalis is a really a taxonomic case. It um, includes four cryptic species named from A to D, with type C, type A is the Sayona robusta, type B is the proper Sayona intestinalis, while type C and D are only molecularly described to date. Furthermore, Sayona intestinalis and Sayona ruri are not mole are just molecularly distinguished. It cannot be uh, molecularly distinguished. So we found this really peculiar specimen along the Italian coast with character that were not observed in other species. We studied the morphological analysis and we saw that the branchial sac, the spermid papillae, and also the number of siphons and muscle bands were intermediate between all the species belonging to the genus Sayona. So we call this species Sayona intermedia. Then at the same time, we performed also molecular studies uh, based on three, three mitochondrial uh, fragments. The first one was the CO1. We gathered all the sequence that we did, we obtained and also from the database. And we saw that with uh, using the method of maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods that uh, identified all um, with a high support, as you can see from the, uh, the bootstrap, um, all the species belonging to the Sayona. So Sayona type D, type C, intestinalis, robusta, and varsi, and also our species as a different species with a high support. Then we perform also some uh, a species delimitation analysis using the ABGD, the automatic barcode uh, gap discovery. That is a method that um, uh, clusters sequences using the barcode gap or um, the in inference, the statistical inference uh, between the, the inter and intraspecific uh, diversity. Uh, in clustering the sequences in different operational taxonomic units or OTU. And we saw that this method in the identified our Sion intermedia as a different OTU, so a different species. These results were also confirmed by the use of the other two mitochondrial fragments. So you see that our Sion intermedia is a different species with high support and also a different OTU with Sion and Varsi. 
So in this framework, my project was the, uh, as, as a main goal, the optimization of this protocol of species identification combining morphological and molecular studies in acidians in order to create or update the acidian checklist in the different areas. And also an important part was the identification of possible non-indigenous species and cryptic species in the, this area. What are the area? Roscoff, Heraklion and Elat. Why I choose this area? First of all, France's northwestern coast hosts several alien and cryptic species. <laughs> belonging to the Botryloshi series, hot spot of, of introduction of the Cessian alien species. So what I did in each, uh, in each access providers, I had the incredible support of the local researcher and staff. I had also the opportunity to establish my specimen in aquarium and to dissect and to do morphological observation uh, through microscope of all my acidians. Then I also performed DNA extraction and mitochondrial CO1 amplification by PCR. So the most important part, it was the sampling and I was able to uh, go diving or snorkeling with the support of great uh, divers from each local research team and to collect uh, my acidians. One important step uh, after the collection is the narcotization of the acidians because uh, uh, if you want to do a really precise and detailed morphological description, it's really important that the tissue has to be relaxed. So mental crystals allow this uh, relaxation. Then for each for each uh, acidians, I took a subsample preserved in 99 ethanol for molecular analysis. Furthermore, in each uh, sampling site, what I did, I chose an anthropic site and a natural site. What does it mean? The anthropic site was, uh, um, was chosen artificial structure, while the natural site Side was less impacted site without, uh, so it was like the tidal habitat in Roscoff of the reef in Elat on the long, or, or um, the coast along uh, Crete. The first anthropic site was the Roscoff Marina. What did I find there? I found three non indigenous species that was the Denomax Rillum, the Prosoma Listerianum, and Parophora japonica. Parophora japonica is a typical species of the Pacific Ocean. It is originally from, the, uh, from China, it is also in Japan. It was also spotted in Korea and Russia. This species is known to overgrow to mussel and oyster cultures in aquaculture facilities. Then I found the Prosoma listerianum. This is a typical species of the northeastern Atlantic Ocean, really widespread in US, Canada, and also Brazil. Then we found the Denum vexillum, that is a cosmopolitan species, is highly invasive potential. It, in fact, it can grow in really big, it can reach meter these colonies of these species, and it can displace and suffocate all the species. Then at the low tide in Roscoff, it's really an amazing place to collect acidians because you can just go out and collect them and grab them like flowers in the fields. And what I found there, cryptic species, one cryptic species belong to the Botrylus Shosteri species common, and found any non-indigenous species. Then we went to Elat. So from the Elat Marina, I found two non-indigenous species that were Sayona robusta and Sia Lapricata. Sia Lapricata is a typical species from the Pacific Ocean. It's really widespread also in the Mediterranean Sea and its origin cannot be addressed. While Sayona robusta is a typical and endemic species of the Mediterranean Sea. It is an interesting species because it's one of the few cases of anti leception immigration from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. Then I found a further two species that are endemic from the area, from the Red Sea, but uh, Erdmanian Momus and Falusia nigra, but these two species are known in the Mediterranean Sea as reception immigrants. Then I went to collect in the amazing reef of Elat, and I found several indigenous species, among the solitary named the Carpa, Alocinzia, and along the, uh, the colonial Diplosoma, Botrylodes, and Didem. Also here, I didn't find any non-indigenous species. Then I went to the last access providers. So the anthropic site that I choose was the Heraklion and the Agios Nicolaus Marina. What did I find here? Several non-indigenous species. So I found the Armenian Mosmus and the Falusia Nigra that, as I told you before, are immigrants and Lesepsian immigrants from the Red Sea. While 
And then I found also Simplegma bacchinialmi, that is also a known species that comes from the Red Sea, because there are several records from Israel, Lebanon, Greece, and the westernmost records, it is from Sardinia. It has been uh, recorded two years ago. And then I found Scale Africata, this is the, also from the Pacific Ocean, and Ectenacidia turbinata, that is from Northeastern Atlantic Ocean. Especially this species was a new record for the area. This species is called a cryptogenic species because its origin is not, cannot be addressed specifically. Why? Because uh, ascidians are really difficult to identify and there is another species, it's a congenetic species that is really similar. So it's possible and it's likely that some uh, records of the species were misidentification of this other, this Ectenacidia turstoni. To uh, correctly identify this species, you have uh, to um, dissect it and to count the rose stigmata and also the folds of the stomach and also the shapes and the peculiar characteristic of the transect muscles. Here I count the mean density of the colonies along three transect in the marinas and I found 20 colonies um, um, and uh, uh, colonies with uh, ranging with 10 to 400 soils, so really big colonies. Then in the natural site along the coast of Crete, I found monospecific population of the non-indigenous species at Mania Mopus. So this species is a reception immigrant and usually is restricted on artificial structure. Even if in a couple places in Israel and also in Castelloliso Island in Greece, it was also found along the coast nearby. This um, this finding uh, supports also the highly invasive potential of these animals that can easily um, spread not only in artificial structure, but also in natural sites. So concluding, what did I find? I found several non-indigenous species in all anthropic sites in the three areas. A lot as the last number of non-indigenous species recorded. I didn't find any non-indigenous species in Roscoff and a lot natural habitats. In fact, in both uh, the anthropic and the natural sites of Elat and Roscoff were characterized by different community of Assyrians. Two species in Elat Marina were widespread in the Mediterranean Sea, and this is uh, Fallusia nigra and Hermania momus. Specifically, Hermania momus was uh, recorded not only in the marina of uh, Crete, but also in natural habitats with comparable densities. A new non-indigenous species was also recorded in uh, Nicolaus Marinas, and it was Ectenescida turbinata. One, and also I performed morphological description. This data can be a baseline for further studies, like um, ecological monitoring studies, and also metaphor coding studies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Frederica. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, can you just type them first on the on the chat so that I know who wants to talk? Um, well, I, I have maybe a couple of questions. Or so the first one is uh, so it's it's although you found quite a few non-indigenous species. In fact, only one seemed to have spread out into you know more natural areas. Exactly. So, uh, mm -hmm. so what, what do you think? Do you think that so basically many of these will not, um, you know, expand, or or do you think they may be? Uh... Yeah, uh, there are two possible uh, two possible answers to that. It's possible that community, the community, the indigenous communities is healthy, and so it um, um, the non-indigenous species uh, cannot uh, uh, settle. In the, in the reef, for example, of Elat, or in the tidal habitat of Roscoff, or uh, may, maybe, and so maybe there are not so many impact, human impact activities that affect this area, or uh, uh, the non-indigenous species are not able uh, to, to spread so much uh, in these areas. Mm -hmm. So what, what, do you, what do you think is the main factor for competition between these species? Is it for space or is it for some other you know, is there any other factor that could be contributing to, to competition? Uh, yes, for sure is the space and also uh, the fact that the, um, these species are um, um, mainly in polluted areas is that because they are also uh, filter feeders. So in areas that have a lot of nutrients, so 
are eutrophic areas, they of course uh, can um, uh, live better. While when you go to Crete Coast, for example, that is uh, uh, olive Egotrophic area, it's, uh, it's difficult to, for them to resist. So also the finding of a non-indigenous species there, it's a, a little alarm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and maybe, you know, the, this barcoding, can you, can you, let's say, use this for quantification? I think it mainly about, about larvae and stuff. Can you actually... Uh, use it both to identify and eventually quantify larval stages in, in the environment, you know, like eDNA. Uh, yes, this, uh, this is interesting. I don't, I don't actually do that. And uh, I think that it will be really interesting to, um, to perform that. Uh, and um, in, that's why I'm, uh, I'm doing, I usually extract DNA from, uh, from the gonads and uh, also I tried from larvae and I obtained, uh, I obtained results. So I think that these, um, these um, fragments that I obtained and I also submit to the database can be actually used for metal barcoding and to find these, uh, these species and to identify these species from environmental uh, um, samples. Uh -huh. Okay, any questions? No, so the next talk will be in 10 minutes. We have to keep to the times because of the people who may, may come in. Um, so maybe we can, we can have a video uh, now. Probably some of you may not have seen yet the assembled video. Barbara, could you have the video? First-class scientific research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union-funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry, or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e infrastructure, and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities ranging from interacting with new users and businesses to cryobanking marine organisms to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. OK, 
Okay, so NHPS will uh, provide the advance with three vouchers, which we'll distribute at the end of the of the meeting. Uh, so three vouchers for 50 euros, I think, uh, that you can use to purchase uh, materials from, from, the, from the company. Uh, I also would like to say at this stage, you know, you saw the video of the Assemble Plus, it mentioned that the project was basically finished, but in fact, with the, with, with, with the, the pandemic, uh, we're going to delay it until the end of 2022. We don't know yet if we're going to be able to open a new call, uh, but at least there are, you know, there's a backlog of visitors that need to to go to this to the stations. Um, so, so that we'll continue, and certainly we are looking to continue into another project if there is an opportunity. The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity, and climate change research. EMBRC supported research has already led to novel, high impact research in human health, product and medicine development, and aquaculture. And it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders. Okay, so welcome back. So now we're going to have Two talks, which in fact, uh, the work went into the same stations at the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute in St. Eustatius, in the, in, the, in the Caribbean, of course. Uh, so the first one is by Ashwin Engelen, he is a, a scientist at the Center of Marine Sciences here in Faro, uh, Portugal and uh, he's going to talk about the biogeography of the seagrass, uh, Alodule rite and Calerpa seaweeds and their associated microbiomes. Please Ashwin, you can start. Thank you Adelina for the introduction uh, and for the invitation. Uh, let me see if I can share the screen. It's visible to you? We can see it, yes, it's working. Okay, okay so indeed, um, we applied for a project in the Caribbean at St. Eustatius. Uh, this was a combined project, so in, that is uh, basically covered in the, in the title. It's, uh, it's a project uh, based on the, uh, on the Seagrass Halodula Rite project that uh, 
Anna Tavares is doing for a PhD. You see her here on the water at the site. And uh, my work on the cholerica seaweeds and their microbiome. So a little bit of background. I think most of the people can distinguish some algae from seagrasses. So seagrasses are true plants in contrast to seaweeds. And the seagrasses have uh, very differentiated structures uh, with leaves and roots and rhizomes and flowers and seeds. Whereas uh, seaweed, seaweeds don't have these, but there are some seaweeds that are kind of seagrass lookalikes. Um, these are green seaweeds from the genus Calerpa. Um, and uh, in contrast to uh, the seagrasses, uh, they have also uh, different morphological structures, but in the end, these are not created by different uh, cell differentiations, but actually this is uh, single-celled organisms and it's probably the biggest cell celled organism in the planet. Um, so a little bit of background for the project is um, we work a lot on marine forest distribution and shifts and losses and uh, seagrasses have not been doing so well over the last decades. Um, there is a little bit of hope in Europe. The declines are, are decreasing a little bit. Um, what is part of the problem is uh, most of the time it's uh, human impact and now uh, climate change. Uh, what you see, what we see is that there is a, a strong lack of knowledge in the in the tropical area. So most of the work has been done on temperate, cold temperate species, but in the tropics there is a, a lack of knowledge in general. And that's also what you see in the in the world map of studies where we have where people have been uh, measuring the decline or the increase of of seagrasses in general. Um, in the Caribbean, the decline is probably mostly due to uh, invasive seagrass, uh, Halophila stipulacea, on which Guidon after me will uh, present a very detailed study. So I don't go into very much details in, in this case about this detail uh, decrease there. Um, but um, on Sinterstatia, there are extensive, almost endless meadows of this invasive uh, species. And did, this causes a, a strong decline of the, of the native seaweeds, on, among which the hollow dealer uh, right eye that we study. What is still amazing is that uh, if you see these tiny populations that are left over, uh, you can still see organisms that are associated uh, to them and that uh, use them as a habitat, like, for example, these, this pair of, um, of pipefish uh, that pretend to be part of the seagrass meadow uh, in order to avoid the predation of their uh, predators in, in, in the area. Um, the, the marine uh, microbial background is a little bit probably known well about the terrestrial plants where uh, along the roots microbes help in the acquisition of resources and especially with nutrients. But uh, this is not different in the, in the marine habitat. And actually, we increasingly see that uh, microbes are, are extremely important for the marine organisms in all kinds of manners when it comes to uh, carbon cycling or plant defense or coral evolution, uh, handling environmental stress. Uh, microbes are in, involved in uh, practically every marine organism. And this is very clearly shown, for example, in the, in the sea lettuce. I think everybody knows the sea lettuce ulva uh, because it occurs everywhere. Um, uh, spores of these seaweeds, for example, they don't develop uh, or don't develop normally if there are not any bacterial compounds uh, around that uh, trigger the morphogenesis of these species. And this is work by Thomas Wickerts' group that has shown that uh, in some cases, at least two types of bacteria and their compounds are necessary for a normal development of, uh, of ulva. And Thomas has been in CCMR several times uh, during, uh, during the old assemble kind of program to, uh, to establish and work on this. Um, so the story of Halodilu Raithiai, like I told you, it's, it's Anna Tavares, her thesis, started for me uh, several years ago, when on a trip to Cabo Verde and for teaching purposes there with Esther Sarau, um, we actually identified the first records of a, a, a meadow of this seagrass in the Eastern Atlantic. And uh, since then, you know, there was a growing interest in, in, in these seaweeds. 
in seagrasses, sorry. Um, our genetic biogeographical studies uh, are usually kind of concentrated on the, like I said, the Northern hemisphere. So the temperate species and what we see there is that uh, as climate changes and warms up, we see that species are shifting northwards um, and that the Southern kind of distribution limits our populations are lost. And with that, actually, usually, like Esther told in the in the plenary plenary speaking uh, that she did, is that uh, we then also lose usually a, a large part of the genetic diversity of species because most of the genetic diversity is in the southern part of the northern hemisphere distribution of most species. With tropical species, this is less known, and so we use this opportunity to start gathering samples uh, from these species, tropical species, Hallelujah Rightii. To look into the distribution of genetic diversity and genetic structure in this distribution. Now, this was uh, uh, helped by uh, the publication of Patrick Larkin, who developed uh, microsatellites, which are markers that actually can use for population genetic level studies on this species. So, uh, Anna uh, obtained samples from all these different points that you see here, among which in the central part of the Caribbean, you see Synthostasius where we sampled three populations. Uh, and she used eight microsatellites to study the population genetic structure. And when we look at the results, the, then it's very clear that there is uh, three very broad groups uh, shown uh, in this both graphs is that uh, one side, we have the African populations that go from Mauritania basically all the way uh, down the coast. Uh, then we have the, the Caribbean and the Brazilian group. And then we have one in the, with two samples locations in the, in the Gulf of Mexico that come from Texas. So there is a very clear differentiation uh, on the large scale among the different uh, groups in the, in, the, in the Atlantic in this case. Um, if we dive a little bit deeper in the structuring, of the genetic populations. Uh, then we see that um, on the uh, west side of the Atlantic, there is quite a lot of differentiation among the different populations. So the Texan populations are quite distinct. And then if we go to the, to the Caribbean, um, all the populations around Synthostasius are basically uh, identical. And then on the island of Curaçao, which is more, more in the south of the Caribbean, we have three populations of which two are identical and one is, one is quite different. And I'll come back to that. Um, then we have the Brazilian populations, uh, which are kind of split in two. So we have say Northern Brazil and Southern Brazil, which have a different genetic imprint. And uh, we see a little bit of the same in the, in the West Coast of Africa. Although there, there is a less strong differentiation. You see there is kind of a genetic structure based on the purple and the, and the yellow groupings which are mixed in most of the, of the population, but there is the tendency for the, the purple groupings to be more in the north um, and the yellow group the genetic imprint more, more in, into the south. What is interesting, especially here, is, is that uh, uh, the local differentiation on island scale uh, is, is, is extremely low. So yes, in Synthostasis, for example, all the populations are the same. Uh, but on Curaçao, there was this one population that was different. And actually, it's mostly linked or most similar to the southern Brazilian kind of populations, which raises a lot of uh, questions on how this connection could have been established. Um, what we know about that location, actually, and this, this is an aerial picture of that location on the, on the south coast of, of um, Curaçao, is that this place used to be a harbor with a fortress uh, on one part of the hill, there was a fortress with uh, cannons and on the other side also protecting this kind of natural harbor uh, where there was a, uh, you see the little lake behind it, there was a lot of salinas. So there was a lot of salt trade there and the reef in front of it is actually quite poor because of the ballast stones that, uh, that the ships would drop in order to be able to take in the salt. And so one of the high what that technical kind of uh, backgrounds could be actually that there, there could have been human interference, human uh, trade, which might have involved uh, seaweed, seagrasses, um, kind of making the link between Brazil and, and Curaçao. 
Uh, oh yeah, um, one point to say, so that in contrast to if changes happen in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, in this case, most of the, of the genetic diversity is kind of uh, locked on the, um, on the west side um, of the Atlantic. And uh, we see at least on the, uh, on the few islands that we have been sampling in the Caribbean, we see strong differences. So if invasive seaweeds kind of um, diminish or remove uh, native seagrass populations, this could, this could actually uh, remove also a large part of the genetic diversity of this species with, with probable consequences for future uh, recuperation or adaptation um, on the long term. Um, then um, to come into Curaçao, is that we have been able to sample more populations around uh, Curacao Island for seagrasses. And we have performed one study on the microbiomes of these seagrasses. Um, what is very clear on the microbiomes of these seagrasses is that um, there is a very clear difference between um, uh, above ground tissues, so the leaves, which we see in the top part of the chart, in, in circles and uh, uh, root tissue, which is in the triangles uh, in, the, in the lower part of the chart. Uh, so there is a very strong differentiation between these types of habitats, leaves and roots. Um, the roots microbiomes are kind of uh, related to the sediment kind of microbiomes. Of course, the, those provide a pool for the, for the microbes that actually colonize the, the roots of the seagrasses. In contrast of to what you would probably expect is this is thought, uh, much less the case for the leaves of the seagrasses. So you see that in this case, the, the seawater samples uh, microbiomes are quite far uh, uh, so dissimilar from the leaf uh, microbiomes. If we look at the three populations that we have been kind of uh, genotyping with ANA, it is clear that the microbiomes in this case differ among all populations. So uh, while um, uh, in the genetically two of the three populations were very, very similar in genetic population structure, in this case, with the, when it comes to the microbiome, all of them are different from each other. Um, so in, in around the Curaçao, we have been sampling three different um, seagrasses and Halodilibrati was one of them. Then we also included the invasive Halophila stipulacea and the native uh, Thalassia testidum. Um, and what we see here uh, in, this, in this graph is that each of them has a very, quite a specific part of the microbiome, while some of these microbiomes are shared among the different uh, seagrass species. Um, what is striking in these numbers when we look at the unique uh, microbes that are associated to this is that actually the invasive species has by far most of the unique uh, microbes associated to it. Um, Halodilibrati is kind of intermediate and, uh, and the native uh, Thalassia has a relatively low number of, uh, of unique, unique uh, microbes associated to it. Okay, then the other story, and this is the story about the, the seaweed that is look-alike of, of a seagrass. Um, so it grows in the same habitats, uh, soft sediments. And here we try to put kind of a, a global picture on the, on the genus uh, Calerpa. So we have been sampling among different places in the world and we are kind of still uh, expanding this data set. Um, during the assemble, we have been able, thanks to the great staff at Santa Stasius, uh, sample at several locations. And in total, I think we have now seven different species that need to be um, analyzed. Uh, these analyses have been kind of uh, delayed with the whole COVID kind of thing. But now uh, we have a new master student that will start working on these. Um, so I cannot really present the, the results of this. So I will use a different example. Um, from French Polynesia, where I also have been sampling uh, at three different islands in French Polynesia, where, for example, we have been sampling at uh, Tetjoroa, which is uh, quite a unique uh, place in the world. And he, this is one of the islands of the archipel of Tetjoroa. This is actually the, the island where Marlon Brando 
perhaps you know from the, 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 the film of The Godfather, um, had, his, uh, had his house when he, he had his Tahitian family there. Uh, and this was work that was uh, in co a collaboration with Maya Zuya, who is a professor at uh, Polynesian University uh, there. Um, just to give you an idea, so we have on the top, you see indicated the three different islands, Tubuai, Tetioroa, Morea. Uh, and on the bottom, which is not so important there, but you see the different species um, that are there. And for each species, we have been analyzing at least two different um, types of tissue, leaf, root, and tip. And um, the, the, the graph that you see is the distribution of the most abundant bacteria uh, found in the microbiomes of each of the, of the samples displayed in different colors. So what is striking there, for example, is that we have very distinct groups. So for example, the first group is, is extremely uh, dominated by these uh, shown here in blue um, OTU of bacteria which covers most of the species uh, that we have been sampling in Tubuai, uh, but not all of them. Then we have the second group here that is shown uh, it's dominated by a different uh, bacteria here shown in kind of brown color, um, which is very abundant uh, uh, across three of the islands. So part of the Tubuai uh, 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 populations have this, Tetioroa and Moria, all are dominated uh, by this single bacterium. And then we have a group of, of Seagra, um, Calerpa species here that come from all the three islands that actually have a very mixed kind of microbiome. So that is not extremely dominated by one or other uh, bacterium, but uh, at least in the controls, which are seawater and sediment, they are, th those are very different. So, the picture that emerges here is basically that these microbiomes are kind of a mix of, um, of local factors, which are dominantly determined by location, by geography and environmental factors, as well as um, the species on which they are associated with. Um, when we dive a little bit deeper in, the, in this information, what you clearly see is that uh, there is differentiation, for example, among the different tissues that we have been analyzing. So root, tip, and leaf have a specific part of the microbiome, um, but there is also a quite large part that is shared. And this you can imagine because in this case, for example, we are dealing with, um, with a seaweed that is uh, unicellular, and the cytoplasm so is shared by all these different uh, structures. So for example, if you would have endobions, they basically could move throughout the entire uh, tissue uh, across all these different uh, tissue types. Uh, what, we, what we clearly see is we, if we dive a little bit deeper in it, we can also kind of uh, distinguish uh, which bacteria are, are in different group and in the little plots, bar plots on the side, the right hand side, you see, you see that there is a very specific combination of different uh, tissues in which certain bacteria are dominant. So some are completely dominated in one while others occur in two or even three and different combinations of these. So this raises a lot of questions about what is the function of these bacteria, what are they doing there, why are they there and not in other uh, parts of, uh, of the seaweed. Um, so overall, I think what, what becomes clear is that these um, assemblages of microbiomes are, are driven in our cases probably by three very dominating factors. On the large scale, it uh, is especially the biogeography that is an important factor, which basically matches um, the population genetic studies that we are doing. Then on the other side, there is a, a phylogenetic or say a species specific factor involved um, in which the, there is a lot of species specificity in the microbiomes associated them. And on the smaller scale, we can also see that there is a um, morphological niches within an individual. There are different 
parts occupied by different microbiomes. Um, and so the, the question is a little bit becoming more and more um, how, what are the organis organismical drivers of, the, of these compositions of, the, of these, if these uh, microbiomes. And for this, we really have to now dive uh, further uh, into these microbiomes and very um, detailed study what each of these microbes um, is doing um, and how this is interacting uh, with the seaweed or the seagrass host. Um, all this work would not have been possible without Assemble. Assemble played an essential part in this. And I want to stress this also that uh, in, in our case, for example, uh, for Anna and me, it was a fantastic opportunity to go to the Caribbean and dive there and sample there. Um, for most of these biogeographic studies, we rely on local people um, to provide samples, but in a way that is kind of negative for young people like PhD students like Anna, because most of the time this means that you get your samples and you get to know your organisms from tubes or sample bags that are sent by others rather than have your own experience in the field. And in this case, for example, uh, Assemble provided unique opportunity for Anna, for example, to really see and learn uh, much more about the ecology of the organism that she, that she works on. And this is a very important to, to get good feeling for what are the drivers on the patterns that, uh, that you find when you study the population genetic structures of these organisms. Okay. I, Thank you for, uh, for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, um, Ashwin. Very interesting. Uh, I actually I have, a, I have some questions, but I'm not sure if you can answer. Uh, so, you, you know, you presented in fact this last slide, the, the various drivers um, in the biogeography bi -geography and, and maybe not just that one. Uh, so the, you find different, different bacteria but is there any, do you have any hints about possible communal functions? I mean, you may have different bacteria, but maybe doing the same thing. So yeah. the question yeah. is, you know, I mean, I, I know that it's, you know, the, yeah, you there, could, there are so many bacteria. Imagine that if you, if you would be the, the host, you don't care so much about the taxonomy of the bacteria that you carry, you care about the functions. So as long yeah. as they provide the functions that you need, you're indifferent of, of the bacterium that you, that you carry. Um, and, and this is what we find um, in many cases is that uh, function comes first. Mm -hmm. And taxonomy is partly probably determined by what kind of taxonomic bacteria are uh, available in the surrounding, which serves as a pool and then uh, which ones are attracted to the compounds that the host is releasing. Mm -hmm. But um, we also find that some bacteria are, are almost always there. Mm -hmm. So it seems like uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a mix of factors, I think. There are some bacteria or genera of bacteria that are always there and there can be different, say, entities of the same genus, but they probably all do the same thing. But we also find, for example, that uh, there is a certain genus available in, uh, along the entire distribution of the species. But if you go from warm to cold, you see actually that the, that the entity is changing. Mm -hmm. So this bacteria, for example, could be the one is, is, is better adapted or provides the function better at high temperatures while the other does better at low temperatures. Mm -hmm. In this case with the cholerpa, it's a little bit difficult because the ones that turn up uh, to be important are bacteria that we don't know much about that also seem to be associated to some sponge mm -hmm. because some are spongy monas, for example, but we lack uh, functional information. And this is basically kind of the hurdle that we hit at the moment. So first of all, I think we need to isolate, try to isolate, isolate those specific bacteria, which is not easy because they probably depend on the host compounds so the media will have to be adapted to that so that we can learn more about the bacteria and we have to try to assemble genomes of these bacteria to learn you know what kind of capacities do they have and what could they provide for the host yeah that's what i was going to say they basically you probably have to start through the 
to the genome to get some idea because it's, it's, it's probably more yeah, difficult. The, the, the problem protein. is in many cases is that the, the, the microbiomes are so complex that if from these kind of uh, metagenomic samples, you try to sequence entire uh, microbial genomes, you, you need to sequence so deep because there are so many different bacteria present that it's very hard to get complete bacterial genomes of, of, of a few of them. All right. Good. Any questions from the audience? We have a very silent audience here. <laughs> That's okay. very interesting. I think this, uh, and uh, I, for sure, uh, bacteria and virus is going to be, the next decade provide quite a, a bit of information about, you know, ecosystem function, I would say, uh, because with, the, with more genomes coming along and uh, and so being such an enormous biomass, I'm sure that this will be, uh, you know, very important. Well, thank you very much, Ashwin. Thank you. Um, and uh, now we we go to the next um, the next talk, which was also uh, the work was done at Saint Eustatius, uh, but this time by Gidon Winters, who's from the Dead Sea Arab Science Center in Israel. And he's going to talk about Allophilus stipulacea descriptors from St. Eustatius, uh, comparisons between a newly invasive population and its native counterpart from the northern Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, Gideon, please go ahead. You just, just click as normally on the, on the PowerPoint. Okay, okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so I actually changed the lecture a little bit, the title. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, so basically the new title is gonna be called Superior Traits of uh, Invasive Compared to Native Populations. And as we said, we, we went to the Caribbean and we're comparing the results from the Caribbean compared to the native Red Sea uh, halophila. And this is a, a long list of many people who were in this project. So um, just a short intro about seagrasses. These are flowering plants, marine flowering plant, plants that have amazing evolution. Uh, they return to the sea from uh, freshwater plants. They have uh, roots, seeds, and flowers. And uh, they form these meadows in shallow near shore marine uh, waters usually in soft sediments, in both cold waters, temperature regions, and tropical regions. Uh, around 60 species worldwide. This is a world distribution. Uh, especially in Elat, but not only, compared to corals, uh, seagrass suffer from uh, very bad uh, public relations. Um, they've received much less uh, attention by, public, by the public, by the scientist community, authorities involved in conservation and management. And this is quite surprising considering the uh, high s the associated value of ecosystem services. They have high primary productivity. They uh, take up uh, pathogens from the water and nutrients. So they filter the water, improve water quality. They sequester CO2. So they actually mediate the pH of nearby environments, which is important for corals, like in this example here. Um, there's cross tra tra trophic transfer from uh, communities of fish that move from one habitat of corals, for example, to the seagrass meadows, and they stabilize the sediment and they provide nursery grounds for fish. So because of these important ecosystem services that are worth nearly $3 million per year per kilometer, um, there's uh, seagrass meadows have been considered keystone ecosystems and bioindicators of uh, ecosystem quality. Um, sadly enough, seagrasses are uh, disappearing at alarming rates around the world. This is a review of 205 sites, historical uh, data that showed most of the colors here are in red, showing that compared to historical data, uh, seagrasses have uh, gone down in all of these sites. Worldwide, we've lost already 110, sorry, 30% of the historically known uh, meadows, and we're losing them at a very fast rate of around 110 uh, kilometers per year since 1980s. The main reasons that, we've lo that we're losing seagrasses so fast it's because we're making the water greener, eutrophication, 
making the water warmer and because of uh, biological invasions. And this is a time of global crisis for seagrass meadows. What's quite surprising is if you look at their loss rates of seagrass meadows, which are around 2.5% per year, 2 to 5% per year, compared to other ecosystems like coral reefs or tropical forests, we all hear about tropical forest loss, which is only 0.5, so nearly a scale of magnitude less than seagrasses, but we haven't really heard in the public and media uh, so much about seagrass loss worldwide. Uh, one of the reasons I mentioned before for loss of seagrasses is biological invasions in marine environments. Uh, and biological invasions in marine environments have caused displacement of native species, structural change in marine habitats, and alterations in food webs. And uh, basically, they're one of the most significant threats Biological invasions are one of the most significant threats to marine and biodiversity, and they can become even worse by climate change, and they also become worse with a glowing, growing global trade of especially marine ships, and uh, that's it's going to be more and more of an issue in the future. So now I'll introduce Halophilus tipulacia. So coming from Elat, the Halophilus tipulacia in Elat in the Gulf of Aqaba is the dominant and sometimes only seagrass species. It's found both in shallow environments, this is around two, three meters, this picture, this picture is around 50 meters, so it's found both in uh, shallow and, and deep environments. Uh, creates these very vast meadows. That's how it looks when you take it out of the water. It has these very deep roots. And in Elat, like in, like, unlike other places around the world, it actually uh, has a very seasonal summer uh, sexual reproduction. This is a male flower, female flower, and that fruit body we see inside. Uh, okay, don't look at their... Uh, <laughs> Just look at the seagrass. Don't look at the stingray. This is how the meadows look in Elat. This is uh, around eight meters deep in the north beach of Elat. So it's very, very, um, I thought it was a very uh, dense meadows until I went to the Caribbean. So uh, what is interesting about Alophila stipulatia is that it's native to the Red Sea here, Indian Ocean here and Persian Gulf. But as soon as the Suez Canal was opened in 1869, it was it moved very fast to the Mediterranean Sea. And it was reported, one of the, the first uh, Lesepsian uh, migrants was reported only 25 years after the Suez was opened. And since then, it's been spreading mostly in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a review we made of all the sites. So this is a relatively old invasion, uh, more than 100 years old, but it's been very slow and it's been limited so far to the eastern basin of the of this uh, eastern med of the basin, and there's even papers that don't even call this an invasive species in this basin. They call it exotic species because it's not really shown. There's one or two papers out there, but that's it, showing that it really is taking the part of taking the location of other species. But in 2002, it jumped from the Mediterranean Sea to, to the Caribbean Sea, and this is just one paper showing in one island, Dominica Island, in 2008. There was a tiny slice of seagrasses here, Alophila stipulacia. Out of 316 duna, uh, hectares, there was around 16, 6%, 19 hectares of Alophila. And there was at least three or four other species around, tropical uh, Caribbean species. Within five years, this jump, this small 6% slice, jumped to 86% of nearly 670 hectares. And these two or three species here, Halophila, uh, sorry, Seringolidium filiform has disappeared and Haladula has been pushed uh, to the limits of much deeper waters. So it's changed the total Caribbean landscape. So unlike the Mediterranean invasion, this is a new invasion in our own uh, lifetime. It's a very, very fast invasion and it's all over the region and it's very aggressive, very invasive. It's not exotic. This is a real aggressive species. But surprisingly enough, although there's been um, many publications are, are on the Caribbean halophila. This is a number of publications in different decades in different uh, regions where we have a, a halophila. So this is the Red Sea here. So these are a number of publications. We have around 30 publications coming from the recent publications from the last 20 years from the Caribbean, but they're mostly on halophila mapping, halophila distributions, or maybe changing in these distributions, or the effects of this invasion on fish on turtles. We have hardly any morphology physiological work uh, from the Caribbean, and there's no comparisons between this uh, Alophila from the Caribbean compared to the other native sites. So this is interesting because there's a growing interest worldwide in understanding the mechanism of invasiveness 
or trying to understand how is Alophila so successful in the Caribbean, but maybe less successful in the Mediterranean, and is that going to change in the future? Um, well, this is a bad story for the Mediterranean Sea because we know that the Mediterranean Sea is one of the warmest climate change, rapidly climate changing uh, marine environments. And uh, Posidonia Oceanica is under great uh, pressure, and it's actually been uh, predicted that it's going to uh, disappear, basically uh, extinct in less than uh, you know, 30 years, 20 years ahead of us. Very sensitive to thermal stress. And on the other hand, so it's going to leave open spaces once it dies, and if there is a lophila around, then uh, we'll probably see invasiveness also in the Mediterranean Sea as well. This is a recent paper showing that if you um, look in green here of the presence of currently a lophila in the Mediterranean Sea, um, and you then you look at climate change scenarios, this is what it's going to look like in yellow in 2050 in a very low uh, low carbon emission scenario here compared to a very high carbon scenario, it's basically going to move easily from the, western, from the eastern Mediterranean Sea, as we see today, into the western Mediterranean basin. So basically, the objectives of this project were to try and understand some of the mechanisms that allow the invasiveness of Alophila in the Caribbean, and what is so different in the Caribbean compared to the Red Sea. So the first thing is just to get to St. Estucius, which is a big project by itself. You fly in this tiny plane, you kind of fly the plane yourself. You work very hard, especially the girls. Um, and this is the location of the island here. St. Stucius is here. This is a really small island and we were on the west side of it. We worked in three sites, two and 18 meters, one next to the reef. So the Halophila meadow comes right, right up to the, to the coral reef here. And actually sometimes even you don't see these hollows here. So it really comes right to the corals. Another site in the same depth, but not near the 50 meters away from the corals and another shallow site at 10 meters. So these are three different sites that we worked at. Two depths, 18 and 10 meters. And we looked at the photo quadrates, percent of cover, we collected material for microbiome work, and we marked plants in, in the field to look at uh, um, growth rates. And then we, we have a bunch of papers coming out from the Red Sea that we can compare to, very recent papers where we, where we looked at the data in the Caribbean, and we compare them to two or three sites of uh, two seasons or three seasons or three depths that we have in the, in the Red Sea. So we, we have a lot of data. And the first piece of results that I can show you is that um, these are the graphs on the left hand side is the data from the Caribbean. This is 10 meters from the Caribbean. This is 80 meters, 18 meters. And you can see that the, compared to the ELAD data on the right hand side of the curve, the cover is actually much higher. And I was very surprised because I've been diving in the Red Sea for 20 years already. And I, then I came to the Caribbean and I saw this huge cover, a percent of cover, and it was really surprising. What's even more surprising is that most of this cover is actually in the deeper sites here and here. So the shoot density is really, really high in the deeper sites, tremendously much more than the uh, Elat. And this is a range of data that we have from the summer and the winter, so February and July for a couple of years already. Then we looked at the biomass, and this was even more dramatic. The biomass, uh, again, in the left-hand side is the Caribbean sites. The biomass were above-ground biomass here, was much higher than the Elat plant, Elat biomass. The below-ground was, again, much higher, and even more in the deeper sites, was really high biomass in the deeper sites. And the above-ground ratio, of course, was, was higher in the Elat plants because they have uh, less biomass in the uh, below-ground. So higher above, above ground biomass in the Caribbean, higher below ground biomass in the Caribbean. And what's really special is that the, you get really high biomasses in the, in the deep sites, 18 meters, uh, it's quite special. Then we looked at the morphometrics. There was no real difference between leaf area here in uh, the Caribbean and in Elat. Of course, as you go deeper from 10 to 18 meters, you have an increase in leaf area. And the same thing you see in Elat and all the sites in Elat here summer and in winter, that's to compensate for the less light. But what was really surprising, if you look at the plant and you count how many epical shoots, so these are these shoots here in Elat, you have only one epical shoot where the regrowth is from. But a typical plant in the Caribbean has, in this example, great example on the picture here, we have one, uh, two, three, four epical shoots. So this is actually growing at the same time in many, many different directions. And if you look at the data, again, you see there's a difference between uh, Caribbean and both of the depths compared to a lot plant uh, number of epical shoots, percentage of epical shoots. So not only are they growing uh, more biomass, but they're actually growing uh, in different directions. Um, yeah. Then we looked at in situ growth. We, we marked plants in the field and we came back for 10 days to collect them. And we look at the leaf formation rates. So this is number of, number of leaves per day. Again, much higher than the Caribbean. 
uh, rhizome elongation, how fast is the rhizome growing, horizontal growth, much faster than the Caribbean. And this was really surprising. The below ground biomass in the Caribbean is, per day is growing much faster. So although there's a leaf formations are quite similar across depth, they're all in the Caribbean, they're all higher than the Eilat plants. And what's also surprising, although there is a deeper plant in 18 meters here, they're growing much faster even in the shallow plants and in the Caribbean and in Elat, so that's quite strange. And then we did some a very nice work uh, from Chiara's lab, uh, from a group from Italy, from uh, Luciana's uh, lab in Rome, where we looked at microbial communities. And what's interesting here is we have, uh, we took um, plants and we sampled them from the second shoot, the youngest shoot, the fourth shoot, sorry, the second youngest shoot, the fourth youngest shoot, and the slightly older sixth shoot. These are the colors here. And we took plants, uh, there were, we took plants, leaves here. We also took rhizomes, below ground tissue, sediment samples, and seawater samples as well. So we have all these samples coming in, environmental samples, these two, and the below ground compartment and the above ground compartment divided into different times. And what we see here is that the seawater sample cluster all together. The samples from the young shoots, which are like the vertical leaves, uh, so they cluster all together. And the old leaves, which is these um, green circles, cluster together next to the sediment and to the below ground um, uh, group. So basically we, we think that we can cluster the sites. It will be clustering through sample type and not by, uh, by habitat. If you look at the LAT samples, this is a paper we published a few years ago, we see a similar picture. The method is a slightly different method, but you know, the donation shows a quite a similar cluster where the type of sample here, which is the green, which is above ground, clusters separately from the below ground uh, cluster here. So of course, both sites, LAT and the Caribbean, are clustering the microbial communities, are clustering by sample type of the tissue rather than the sample site. But we don't know if there's different in the functions of the bacteria. That's another question to find out in the future. Finally, this is the last part of the data I'll show is we actually flew back from uh, the Caribbean to Israel with plants. I was re-bringing back uh, invasive communities back to where they came from in Israel. And we've been growing them in this uh, mesocosm here for a year already, they're still around. So we've been having uh, plants from 10 meters from Elat here and Caribbean plants also from the same depth and we've been growing them for, for a year. So after following them for a few months, we started to do measurements. So we did measurements that we couldn't do in the field. So for example, we looked at the Fe by Fm fluorescence data, quantum yield of photosystem two, and there was no difference between the photophysiology. Then we looked at epical shoots and surprisingly, although these guys have been in the, the aquariums here for six months, they still have more epical shoots in the Caribbean than in Elat. And if you mark the plants and you follow the growth rates, both in new leaves and in new epical shoots, you see that there's a much higher uh, uh, growth rate in the Caribbean. So although they've been acclimating for more than six months in the aquariums, they still remember where they came from. And then just to show you that this, um, this it seems that invasive Caribbean plants are maybe doing better. They grow faster, they maybe are stronger. Have we seen this before? Well, I think we have. A few years ago, we brought plants back to the mesocosm from Cyprus from the Mediterranean Sea, and we grew them actually in the same aquariums with plants from Elat, and we exposed all the populations to, the two populations to thermal stress. So control was 27 and then 29 degrees here for 14 days, and another heat wave here for 31 degrees, 32 degrees. And again, the Elat plants, basically, this is number of shoots, they just crash in temperature, while they control, of course, stay the same. The cypress plants from the Eastern Mediterranean basically hardly fell their heat, their heat wave. Elongation, horizontal elongation, again, crashed in the Elat plants, hardly fell from the cypress plants. PAM fluorometry, Fe by Fm, what I showed before, hardly fell from the cypress plants, but crashes and maybe some recovery in the Elat plants. And even gene expression was very different between 32 degrees in the uh, Elat plants and the cypress plants. So we are seeing basically superior biological traits of invasive Stilophila pistillata, also in the Caribbean and also in uh, Cyprus. So to summarize, I've, I've shown you the first comparison, quantitative comparison between native Red Sea and invasive Caribbean populations. Caribbean plants grew faster, the elongation was, was faster, they accumulated more biomass, especially in deeper sites, and they also grew in more directions at the same time. And compared to the native habitats, we think that this shows that they have superior traits, so this maybe helps them to have a successful invasion. And what are the implications of this for conservation and management? Well, looking at some papers out there, 
when people try to make predictions of uh, what's going to happen in the future to invasive plants or invasive organisms, when they try to make predictions, they look, some of the assumptions they make is they look at characteristics, certain traits in the native site, and they presume they will change, that they will be the same characteristics in the invasive sites. But these measurements, um, and they use this trait to predict what's going to happen in the invasive sites and in new conditions. But clearly, at least for Halophila, we've shown you this is not the case. It doesn't keep its characteristics in the new conditions environment. And uh, where the other implications of this work is maybe some ecological applications. There's a, a theory called evolution of increased competitive ability hypothesis. And this says that under uh, identical con conditions, if you have the same conditions, individuals or individuals or plants in my case, taken from its invasive habitat, for example, Caribbean, can produce more biomass than individuals taken from the species from its native range, like in Elat. And what's gonna happen, and indeed, we've seen this in many papers, in alien environments, plants are more vigorous, they grow taller, they make more seeds than in their native distribution. So what have we seen in the Caribbean? We've seen some proof for this theory in the Caribbean Lophila plants, they grow faster, but we have not seen any sexual reproduction in the, in the Lophila plants in the Caribbean yet. And uh, in this theory, in this hypothesis, the vigor and success of aliens introduced in, in, to introduced areas is supposed to be because of more fav favorable environments in the new environment, favorable conditions in the new environment. And then plants are also released from natural herbivores of competition. But this means that, uh, do we think that in the Red Sea, um, the Lophila, this means that in the native population of the Red Sea, a Lophila should be under herbivory pressure, but I don't think that's the case. I don't believe that there's, a bit very pressure in the Red Sea, and I don't think that the Lophila is growing in the Red Sea under limited resources. So I don't know how we fit into this theory. So are we just comparing populations of different traits, or do plants in invasive habitats always grow faster? Do they always have high stress tolerance? Well, for the students out there, we need to have more student, more students, and of course more work on maybe more common stress garden experiments from invasive and native habitat uh, populations in the future. And that's my talk. Thank you, Gideon. That was uh, very interesting. I, I uh, you know, one thing you didn't mention there was uh, genetics. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are, you know, well, first of all, do you know where this uh, particular population came from? Did it come from the Mediterranean? You know, the one from St. Anastasius. Did it come from the Mediterranean or from the Red Sea? Uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, it could be that there are some mutations that uh, then uh, become advantageous in areas without much competition. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. We have um, some, we've done some genetic work. We've done uh, work on 2 rad genotyping, and we are quite sure that it comes from the Mediterranean Sea. So we're looking at the stepping stones and it comes from the Mediterranean Sea. In the beginning, we thought it might go around Africa and go straight from the Indian Ocean to the Caribbean. But now we're quite sure that it's uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. And for sure, there's some sort of selection process happening in the transport, which is causing these, maybe, causing these super alophilas to be much more stronger or faster or... Yeah. Yeah, it, it could be some, some mutations in particular genes that are key for metabolism or something, I don't know. Uh, but you, you also mentioned that, the, you know, we made that comparison that there was differences. So it may be that these, you know, in some cases, it's a bit like the, like the, the COVID-19 virus. Um, you know, so it's, eventually some mutations may, may, may take over or be beneficial. Um, well, no questions yet. Oh, there is. There are questions now. Um, I can't see them. You're gonna have to read them for me. I can't see them exactly. No, no. They, they, they'll ask. Anna Tavares, can you ask the question? Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. Presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if you have uh, any idea why this species, the biomass of this species, is uh, more abundant in deeper sites than in shallow sites. That's, um, I have been thinking about this question for, <laughs> it makes, it's totally the opposite of everything I've seen before. Um, I honestly, I don't know why. It's very, <laughs> it goes against all the physiological uh, dogmas that we know about, you know, there's less light, there should be 
more sparse, um, less dense meadows and higher leaves, longer leaves and more chlorophyll, which we also saw, of course, but we don't understand why the biomass is higher. Mm. Okay. So, uh, Emanuela Datolo, can I ask you a question? Emanuela? Maybe it doesn't have a microphone. Yes, I see, I see the, her microphone doesn't work, she says. Yeah, so the question is, I was, well, first of all, great work, Gideon. I was wondering uh, if you plan to perform RNA-Sec to compare the whole transcriptorial profile of native versus invasive from the common garden experiment. Um, if we had the money. <laughs> <laughs> quite ridiculous because we have all this mesocosm and we have the plants, but we just don't have the money for the transcriptome. Uh, we've actually re recently uh, with Simon Barak and uh, Maheshi Asanyak from the States, we've uh, made a new genome and we've got a few R RNA transcriptome libraries, but it, we just don't have the money to do the sequencing for, uh, we've tried, we've tried, but that's, a, that's for sure, to find this invasive genes would be for sure uh, a good question to answer in the future. Okay, Ashwin. Hi, Guillaume. Uh, Hello. Yeah, I find it, uh, it is of course very intriguing to find these strong differences. And I, uh, one of the intriguing parts I think is, is the failure of sex basically in the entire invasive range in the Caribbean, right? Mm. Um, could it, could it be that uh, that basically when there would be a switch off of sex that actually then there is a trade off to a lot of other kind of characteristics that would help the species in growing faster, obtaining more biomass and all these kind of things. Do you see in, in ILAT there is some sort of a trade off between reproduction and, and growth? Um, Ashwin, that's a good question. I haven't seen a trade off like this. But we, we worked in Cyprus a few years ago and there was sexual reproduction going on in the site that we were working in in Cyprus. And I don't think it affects, and we brought the plants back to the mesocosm from that population and, and, and they were doing better. So better than the adapt plants in thermal stress. So I'm not sure if uh, there's a trade-off like you think it might be, but uh, time will tell us when it's a good, good, good future study. So do you think there is some sort of a missing an, an environmental window for, for sexual reproduction and flower formation in the Caribbean? Um, in Elat, the signal is the summer or the end of the end of spring, beginning of summer, and the Caribbean has less of a seasonal, si seasonal signals. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be, but um, even in the Mediterranean Sea, we're only seeing one or two populations that have sexual reproduction. So I'm not sure, so how come we're missing it in the Mediterranean Sea, you know, because that could have been a good site for sexual reproduction for Alophila and we're not really, it's very rare to see Alophila reproducing in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, I don't know. I find this ethical shoots thing really interesting. How come they're growing in so many different directions at the same time? That's a, quite a strange trait. Yeah, you would say there is a different stimulus there, right? That, uh, yeah. if it, and yeah. And it has nothing to do with this infection, uh, the lack of sex with these infections that we see, you know, what is it, this, this, uh, uh, what is it, is it an old mycetes or these protists, you know, that, that are, that, that showing up these black tissues? Uh, we didn't see any in our sites. Oh, so okay. I, I had them from uh, Stasia. Ah, uh, okay. No. Okay, well. Thank you very much, Gideon. That was uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, now we move on to the next talk. Uh, it's a, an evolutionary um, talk about parasites, parasites with a sting, evolution and genomics of host parasite interactions in the Cnid area. And it's by Astrid Olzer, and she's from the Biology Center of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, and she visited Kristinberg Marine Research Station. <clears throat> so please go ahead. So hello, everybody. Um, can you see my talk? Was on my yep. first slide? Yeah, OK. okay. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> I am uh, today uh, talking to you about cnidarians, parasitic cnidarians more specifically. And uh, just in general, I would like to mention that the um, 
it, it is important to know that the biodiversity on our planet is to a great extent uh, the result of uh, the evolutionary history of species interactions. And uh, parasitism is one of the most successful uh, lifestyle uh, on the planet. In fact, 50% um, of the organisms on the planet are parasitic and about 10% of metazoans. And today I shall talk to you about uh, cnidarians that are parasites, but also uh, occur as symbionts. It's about uh, host parasite interaction in this group. So, and now, yeah, okay. Uh, so um, we asked ourselves uh, a few years ago just how many lineages of cnidarians have actually established relationships with other organisms. And uh, we keep updating our tree. So this is like a tree in progress and uh, we keep adding species and genes. And uh, it's just a quick view for you to see that uh, the lineages in blue are symbionts or epibionts in, in red, they are parasites. And you can see that, uh, for example, in the hydrozoans. So up here in this large group, you can find a lot of these interactions, uh, a little less in the anthozoans down here. And then we have some uh, really truly parasitic groups, which are the so-called endognidozoa. Uh, to these belong the mixozoa that have, are highly uh, um, diverse. And I'll tell you a bit about some of these um, groups. Here are some pictures for you. Um, uh, so you see on the left, you see um, uh, parasitic hydrozoans. So this, this is very uh, small and thin organisms. That's, uh, those are a species of sanclia that are highly diverse and they parasitize on scleractinian corals. Uh, you can see here, and uh, they actually really grow into their uh, skeleton and uh, other species related to Zanclia, that says Halocorine, for example, they live in a similar way in bryozoans and feed on the tentacles of their hosts. Other uh, cnidarians, such as Aegymnantea, is uh, just a, a parasite, very miniaturized um, hydroid that is uh, sitting on uh, the mantle of its host, uh, which is a, a muscle and uh, is there in a more epibiotic uh, lifestyle, but consuming um, um, parts of, not part, uh, consuming um, products of the, the host. Uh, Hydrichthyes, for example, is an important uh, hydrozoan species that is uh, fish parasitic and, and can occur on different organs of, of the fish. And in anthozoans, we have uh, less, um, uh, so we have only two uh, parasitic lineages, one of which you can see here, this is Piachia. Piachia infects large uh, medusa, uh, pelagic medusa, and uh, these medusa um, are being eaten inside out, and uh, the parasite focuses mainly on, on the gonads, because they are especially nutritious. And then the last group here on the bottom, this is the endocnidozoa. These are my guys, the ones that we work on. So uh, to one uh, lineage that is uh, uh, Polypodium hydriforme, a very strange and aberrant um, organism that it's uh, an Iderian whose larvae enter the eggs of the sturgeon and within these eggs, it consumes the yolk and then produces these long stalks with the medusa, which are then liberated on spawning of the fish. And uh, they are liberated into the water uh, and, and have a free living stage. Uh, and then as, as the only group that's a real, true, full life cycle parasite, uh, it, you find the diverse mixozoans in, uh, in the night area. Now you may uh, ask yourself, um, yeah, in this metagenetic life cycle, how did parasitism evolve in, in which life cycle stage? And um, I have to say that it is uh, almost always um, when, when we come from the archetypal free archetypal free living uh, life cycle of cnidarians which have uh, a polyp stage that is sedentary and that but of the medusa which form the gametes and the gametes um, will form a zygote and the larvae and the larvae settles again and forms the polychaete so in, in the sorry the polyp um, so in in this circle uh, where you find mostly parasitic stages are either the larvae uh, as you can see here, 
or the polyp stages. This is also a larval stage. Only in the mixozoans, which are parasitic throughout their whole life cycle, uh, we cannot identify these uh, original archetypal uh, life cycle stages anymore because they are so reduced. Parasitism in the Nideria also drives like life cycle changes. And I'll show you an example here. Um, so um, this is an example from the group uh, Trachy. Lina, this is a, a group of uh, hydrozoans, and uh, you can see it's some of these, uh, the limnomedusa, they, they live in uh, closer to shore areas, in, in more shallow waters, whereas these groups here, they, they are uh, pelagic. So um, uh, they have kind of adapted their, their the archetypal uh, life cycle to, to to where they live. Obviously, in the open ocean, there is uh, little settlements where they could uh, sediments where they could settle on. So these uh, this group here, you can see marked in black, uh, have uh, almost exclusively medusa stages. Whereas down here, you have a mix of medusa and polyps because polyps can settle on on coastal sediments. And then, if you look at this group up here which is labeled in green, and the only organism here that is labeled in pink, those are the parasites. So they drive the life cycles in the direction of the polyps, because polyps, I think, are just better uh, parasites, because in the end, if you reduce the tentacles, you end up with a vermiform stage that can uh, maybe better move around in a host than, than a medusa could. And I'll just show you some examples here from the uh, the species Cunha, which is up here in this group, just so you see what you can do when you live in the open ocean, you just take a, an eritic, uh, basically a, a free swimming polychaete, and uh, this, uh, um, this species, um, it, it, it forms buds as a polyps, and then th these are the polyps, and the polyps form medusa within the silomic cavity of these polychaetes. So that's... Um, a uh, really beautiful parasite. And uh, this down here is Monobrachium, so that's this species here. And, and it has really reduced um, its life cycle to being only these parasitic polyps, and it has a gonophore instead of a medusa stage that would uh, produce um, uh, the gametes. Yeah? Uh, so how much do we know about these groups and their genomics? Really, we know very little about these groups and about their genomics even less. So the puzzle is not one missing piece, on there, but many missing pieces. Uh, we have 45 genomes and 150 transcriptomes available from Nigerian high throughput sequencing data. Uh, but only 11 data sets for parasitic or symbiotic Nigerians, and eight of those are actually mixozoans. So we basically know nothing. So one of our long-term aims was to collect more of these species and to produce genomes and transcriptomes for these unexplored uh, groups and to better understand uh, their phylogenomics and comparative genomics uh, and the evolution of parasitism at the base of uh, the metazoa. And one of the organisms we collected within the Assemble uh, program is Edwardsiella carnea. This is an anthozoan. And I'm very proud of this picture here because this is an anthozoan whose larvae live inside uh, the, the ctenophore host Nemiopsis. This is Nemiopsis. Nemiopsis is about five to 10 centimeters in, in length. And this is a picture just taken purely by the mobile phone. And I was lucky to find an individual that has so many um, uh, parasites on it. Um, this is from... Uh, uh, a publication that just demonstrates that these larvae later drop off and they develop into the mature um, polyps. So uh, we were at Christineberg Marine Station and before I get into a few more data that we produced there, I'll just tell you something curious uh, on the background of Edwardsiella. There's actually many Edwardsiella species, but only two of them are parasitic. And that's Edwardsiella lineata, which uh, originates in North America, and uh, Edwardsiella carnea, which uh, appears here in, in, in our area, in Europe. 
So both of them appear to use Nemiopsis as a host and Nemiopsis originates from North America. So it, it, it is an, an invasive species. And the question uh, was asked in previous years already, whether uh, maybe Nemiopsis brought uh, Edwardsiella carnea, uh, sorry, lineata over the Atlantic with it. And uh, it was studied, this was studied in a molecular way, but uh, the, the authors who described this and who looked at this data uh, determined that the parasitic states uh, found in, in Europe is actually of a very, very um, close uh, molecular distance to Edwardsiella carnea and not to lineata. Anyway, though the parasite is not invasive, the host still is, and the host became the new preferred host for Edwardsiella carnea, who was previously hanging around in, in, in another ctenophore. And we can find very, very high densities of this ctenophore and of uh, actually Edwardsiella carnea uh, within it. And that's important. And uh, so here is just some, some data, other uh, images basically, or documentation on uh, what else we found in Nemiopsis uh, of Christine Berg in Sweden. And uh, <clears throat> This is uh, um, just uh, some details that we studied on the, the, the Edwardsiella that we, we collected. So we had a better look at the head region, we just studied the ultrastructure here and, and determined what is inside the gut to see if they actually feed on uh, Nemiopsis itself or, or on its uh, gut contents. And yes, it is the gut contents that they are after. And they actually, the parasites accumulate uh, close to the anus because there's a high concentration of, of, of nutrients going out there. And uh, yeah, we did some ultrastructure on, on, on several aspects, also the uh, nematocysts, and we pr produced a, a, a genome for the species as well. Um, but when we looked at, we looked at two populations. So we went out with small boat and bigger boat <laughs> several times. And uh, we looked at two populations, one at the depth of 10 meters and one at the depth of 40 meters, approx. And uh, we found in, 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 apart from looking at the difference, also something very interesting. And that was trematodes. We found a lot of trematodes in, in Nemiopsis. And, uh, and we, most of them belong to, we sequenced them, so to this, Likely, likely to this species, uh, Halvorsenius exilis, and um, this this uh, trematode occurs in um, uses as first intermediate hosts uh, copepodes. And now, of course, uh, Nemiotis is a very successful plankton feeder, and uh, hence you can find a number of copepodes in the stomach uh, all the time. And uh, we think that Halvorsenius exilis, the trematode, just um, exits the, the copepodes in the host and uh, uses um, Nemiopsis as a paratenic host for its further distribution. And likely, this is also happening with uh, the antozoan. So, because uh, um, because Nemiopsis is such a successful invader, we believe that these species um, that it takes with it uh, are actually getting to have a much larger distribution. Another thing we did in Christineberg is we looked at the uncharted mixozoan biodiversity by eDNA. No, we, of course, we didn't do that there, but I collected samples for it. And uh, this is my colleague Inga Martinek, who actually works on this. And uh, she will give a talk next Friday uh, in this conference. Uh, and, and uh, at the same time in the afternoon. So if you want more details on this, uh, then, then please uh, have a look at it, at this talk. Um, just in a very brief note, of course, mixozoan spores here are about 10 microns in size. So if we don't look for the true biodiversity by eDNA, I think we have little chance of finding out anything about this from just fish dissections. So a little bit more detail about the mixozoa because they are my favorite. So they are highly diverse. They are uh, the only cnidarians that have an obligate two host life cycle and are fully parasitic during their whole life cycle. They have high host flexibility. So they alternate between annelids and one group also infects bryozoan hosts and fish hosts. And they form as transmission stages, these, these spores. And, uh, they have also been reported from like monogenium parasites or trematodes, trematode parasites 
from fish as hyperparasites. So they can switch, they even switched, I think their reports from octopus and they just take anything that is around. They're amazingly well adaptive to any system. Uh, they are strongly reduced in size and that's not just in their spore stages, which are usually about six cells. Also here, these are from our model system. These are uh, the proliferative stages and you can see they have mostly only uh, two uh, nuclei and two cells and the largest maybe have about 20. They have a strong importance, these parasites, to fish populations and aquaculture. Fish populations, uh, yeah, and that's mainly why I have a laboratory with 20 people that actually work on this, only on this group of parasites, uh, because they cause a lot of damage in aquaculture. It's not many species that cause this damage, but the ones that do are uh, very important to the industry. But the parasites are also important to the environment itself. And this uh, has come up over the last years with uh, regard to the climate change that we have caused on this planet. So uh, we've seen a massive geographical expansion uh, of, of uh, for example, this species, Tetracapsuloides bryosalmone, that causes these hugely enlarged and, and prolific, uh, proliferative uh, kidneys. It's called Tetracapsuloides bryosalmone. And um, yeah, so it, it has been reported to cause deaths in the Yellowstone River. There were so high fish mortalities that they had to close the 300 mile stretch of the, the river because it was just flooded with up belly upside down fish. And uh, here is a map from Austria. There was a recent study that came out in 2020. This is um, shows that within the next 10 years or so, all these areas that occur here in orange or black, uh, those populations of, of salmonids will have died out due to this parasite within that time. So yeah, that's what my lab does. We work on strategies against these parasites and we try to develop uh, functional feeds and uh, down to vaccines. But I didn't want to bore you with the molecular part of um, trying to design uh, anti-parasitic strategies so much, much more. I wanted to introduce you to uh, the origin of the mixozoan success. And this is based on uh, the, the history of their uh, evolution. So uh, we did a study in 2018 uh, asking us the question, so how old are mixozoans actually? And uh, we did this multi-gene analysis using beast and we used a lot of metazoans to, to align with and made a tree. And you can see from this data and we used really a lot of anchoring points uh, that mixozoans are possibly the oldest metazoan parasites on earth. They emerged some 200 million years ago and uh, the emergence at this time suggests that they emerged as um, parasites of uh, basal uh, invertebrate lineages of, of, of bryozoans where they actually and, and annelids where they actually occur uh, to date as well. Uh, fish, on the other hand, occurred on our planet much later. So uh, we think that they were acquired as secondary hosts. And another proof for this is given when we look at the um, phylogenetic tree of mixozoans, there is one, two, three, four large lineages, and they are well defined by their hosts, the bryozoan hosts, polychaete hosts, oligochaete hosts, and this one that we're still not quite sure because we don't have molecular data confirming any life cycles. So we did a co-phylogenetic study and we could show that uh, co-evolution is evident from, from these methods and, and strongly uh, supported. Uh, you see here the tree of the parasites mapped in blue to the tree of the host, which occurs in black. And uh, this is uh, um, a perfect match really. So what happened afterwards, uh, once they were in their uh, invertebrate hosts? So yeah, they acquired fish as secondary hosts. And um, we can see in these indi individual lineages of polychaete infecting, oligochaete infecting, and so on, other um, 
mixosomes that uh, this happened in parallel in all of these lineages, large lineages. So we have all basal lineages in within these occur in sharks and rays or chimeras. So contichtians are much older than teleost hosts. So they basically, as soon as fish occurred on this planet, they uh, entered them and they have a successful story in developing in fish. Important is also uh, the development in different organ systems, which they never switch. Once they enter, uh, let's say the bilary ducts, they always stay as parasites of the bile or uh, the liver. And what is the real story of success here is the massive host specification linked parasite diversification that happened in the mixozoa. You can see this is a lineage over time a plot. So the number of lineages are here on, on this axis and the time is here. So this uh, few lineages were present in in, in bryozoans, then the, they occupied the, or they entered annelids. So they finally uh, found the first chondrichtians, first uh, teleost, and then tetra, some tetrapod host as well. And what you can see here, and this is a logarithmic scale, is the number of individual new lineages that, that occurred in, in, in the fish. And uh, so most of uh, the mixozoans are actually occur in two hyperdiverse but uh, relatively recent fish clades. And uh, these clade together, clades together host about 50% of all mixozoans that have been sequenced to date. So um, uh, the co-diversification with the fish host is essential to diversity of this uh, uh, group. Yeah, but then if you enter a fish host, that's also a very large challenge to you because uh, fish, and in contrast to all the invertebrates that uh, mixozoans used before as their hosts or have been using for many years at that point, is uh, that fish can respond to parasite challenges very specifically and they have an immunological memory. That uh, uh, means if you want to reinfect, it's like they have a vaccine, so there is no the reinfection is, is, is hindered to some degree or impossible. But then, of course, fish and mixozoans have co-evolved and uh, mutually adapted for about 440 million years now. And guess what? Yes, mixozoans have developed immune evasion strategies. And uh, we can see that in our own lab model that uh, when you take um, from infections uh, reared at different temperatures or also over time, uh, you can find that there are different antigens present in, in the parasites lot that, lots that we isolate. So mixozoans vary their surface protein code during their intrapiscine development. Yeah, what are the main challenges in, in uh, mixozoan genomics? And to some degree, this is also, or many of these points are also valid for uh, Cnidarian parasite genomics. So for mixozoans, one of the most important things is that they have an extremely fast evolutionary rate. So we have large difficulties to identify any gene homologs. In fact, we can annotate about 15% of their genomes. Uh, there is a lot of missing information, as I already said, although the mixozoans are still better off than most of the other uh, parasitic cnidarians, the genomes are extremely small. They're one-tenth of their free living cnidarian ancestors and one-tenth of their fish host. That means we continuously deal with contamination. And then when you, we deal with a fish host, like such as, for example, carp in our lab that is tetraploid, the contamination just shows even more and, and, and genes that are very lowly expressed are extremely difficult to find. There are few in vivo life cycles that people can work with and there is no published in vitro model. Uh, there is in fact uh, also not much known about the presporogonic development of, of, of this group because they have these miniaturized stages that are so difficult to detect. Yet some papers have been published and they showed that there are a very extreme genomic adaptations to hosts and habitats in the mixozoans and they're very interesting organisms. They lack the key genes and signaling pathway for many things, such as, for example, those related to body plants, because when you are such a reduced organism, you don't need that anymore. They also lost the machinery for DNA cytosine uh, methylation. They have streamlined metabolic repertoires, and uh, this is for me the, the 
cherry on the cake that uh, there is one species known, Heneguia salminicola, that has lost its mitochondrial genome. It's the only metazoan for which this is proven that even the, um, uh, gene, the nuclear genes that are responsible for the, the, the transcription of these um, mitochondrial genes have been lost. And uh, so it, this is a species that inhabits anaerobic sites in both hosts. It lives in um, oligochaetes that occur in anaerobic sediments and in the white muscle of the fish host, which supposedly is also anaerobic. So this is the theory behind why this was lost and why and they are so adaptive to, to any change. So um, with this, I'll leave you, I'll just tell you that parasitian cnidarians have much more to discover. They are extremely interesting and also important. And uh, I hope that I was able to give you some insights into this uh, not so well known groups. Uh, this is my laboratory. Um, I have uh, yeah, a great lab and without them, I, nothing much would happen. And of course, not without funding and Assemble has greatly contributed to this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Astrid. So if there are any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, I, I have some, some, some questions. Um, yeah, as you pointed out, in, in the fish, they have an immune system. And of course, there's mm -hmm. a coevolution uh, and so on. But what is it known about the, the invertebrates? I mean, uh, there must be some kind of coevolution as well. And the invertebrates must have a, some kind of strategy to, to try to avoid the parasites somehow. Or, or is it not like that? I mean, uh, otherwise, the, the parasites would just take over. No, the, of, of course, the invertebrates also have strategies to avoid the, the parasite. It's, they have innate uh, strategies. And actually, fish use to a large extent, you know, in the evolution of, of vertebrates, fish are the most basal and they are very much dependent still on innate Im immune parameters compared with higher vertebrates such as mammals. But uh, the capacity to develop specific antibodies happens for the first time in fish. So this is uh, something new. It's a more challenging host, I'm saying, than the invertebrate. Of course, the invertebrates have innate mechanisms, you know, the like things such as phagocytotic cells and th they exist much earlier in the evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. No questions? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting evolutionary uh, and, and not just a physiological uh, case. Well, if there are no questions, thank you very much, uh, Astrid. Uh, it was very, I know, very nice. Mm -hmm. And also, thank you, all the speakers and all the, the ones that were listening. And to, on Monday, we will start at uh, 9.30 uh, Central European time with uh, an adventure. It's a, it's a talk by uh, uh, Chris Bowler, and uh, it's going to be about the, the Tara expedition. And this is going to be followed by um, some presentations of, of different uh, marine stations in Poland and in Germany. And then we have a series of talks. So uh, I invite you to, to come back on Monday and have a good weekend, everyone. First class scientific research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses to 
cryobanking marine organisms to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you're a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu.